Perfect. So, you know, we're, we're going to start talking about what is zero trust. And really, the concept of zero trust has been around for quite a while. Um, back in 2004, the Jericho Forum had a concept they called deprimerization. And this was kicked off by a guy in the UK Royal Mail named John Mesham. And the idea here is that you need to protect your systems and your data at multiple levels. You know, and, and this includes things like encryption, uh, secure protocols, secure systems, and data level authentication, right? So th this was sort of this first idea that the, the perimeter, you know, a hard perimeter, you know, wasn't really the best place to do all of your security and all of your enforcement. You know, fo following that up, <clears throat> Forrester in 20, 2010 came out with the term zero trust and it was coined by a guy by the name of John Kindervog. While he was there, um, you know, he later came to work for us at Palo Alto Networks and was one of our zero trust evangelists and, and now has moved on to, um, you know, maybe greener pastures, but it's, that, that was really the first time zero trust became a common word. So, you know, this is now about 11 years ago. Following that, Google came out with their Beyond Corp model. And this was really, you know, how do you provide secure access to applications outside of doing things like VPNs? And Google published this in 2014. And what they did is they created a lot of custom proxies that they stuck in front of their critical assets you know, with the intention of getting rid of VPNs very quickly. And, you know, now in 2021, if you talk to Google, they still have a lot of VPN because not all of their applications can be proxied. You know, following that, um, the software defined perimeter was introduced, you know, and, and this was really built around standards based technologies like TLS and similar thing, you know, and encryption really, right, and SAML and certificates on, on how do you authenticate users properly. You know, Forrester then came out with ZTX, which is, you know, this conversation on how does zero trust apply to an enterprise? And, you know, what, what does it mean, right? And it's built on, you know, three pillars, the network, your data, and your workforce. So, you know, with this is, you know, where really my talk's going to start on how do you identify these things and, and what do they mean to your organization? You know, Gartner came out with CARTA, which, you know, is really context aware and adaptive methods of access, which are really key components of zero trust, right? You know, who are your users? What are they doing? How do you continually look at what they're doing and make access decisions based on their behaviors? And then last year, NIST came out with a zero trust framework, you know, followed by earlier this year, the US government came out with executive order and a distance zero trust reference architecture. So there's a lot to unpack here, but you know, the, the, the main takeaway I think here is that you know, zero trust is not a new concept. It's been evolving you know, for the past 15, 16 years. Um, and, and really it's only today where people are starting to zero in on, on what does zero trust really mean for an organization? So you know, with that, what in, this is my view. If there's, um, you know, if there's dissenting views later, I, I'd love to hear it, hear them because zero trust means a lot of different things to a lot of different companies and people. But you know, at the end of the day, zero trust is a strategy, right? You know, how do you minimize the risk of breaches in your organization and eliminate assumed trust, right? So you know, if we look back a number of years, this sort of hard perimeter was where you looked at your users, you looked at the access, you looked at what was happening and you made an enforcement decision. If somebody was inside that perimeter, right, you had a user in your organization, they were typically trusted. You know, they could get to your source code, they could get to your accounting information, you know, to, to the crown jewels, to your, all your data and apps. And it's really a shift away from that idea and saying, hey, you know, who are these users? What devices are they on? Where are they coming from? What are they trying to access? And how do we have a rationalized approach to giving them access to these resources based on who they are? 
um, you know, it's also an architecture and, and it's not a security architecture necessarily. It's an enterprise architecture that involves a bunch of different teams and security can't be the only ones driving this because if in an organization, you don't have the buy-in from your executives, from your developers, from the different teams that own all this disparate data, you're not gonna be successful. You know, and finally, there's, there's really two sides to zero trust, but the, the idea here is that zero trust isn't a product, right? You can't buy a ZTNA solution or a SASE solution and have zero trust intrinsically, right? You know, that, that's one component of it, but there's a lot of other technologies that are involved in this. And, and we'll talk about those in a little while, but, but at the end of the day, you know, process and people have to be addressed and it's a culture shift. And a lot of different people need to be included in this. So you, you've got to make a few assumptions when you're looking at adopting zero trust in an organization. And you know, the first thing you have to do is you have to assume that your environment is hostile, right? You, you, have to, you have to approach how you're implementing these security and controls from the perspective that somebody active in your is active in your environment in a bad way today. And then, you know, if that's the case, you only want to give people access to what they need. And that access needs to be elevated based on information, right? You can't just assume that just because I say I'm Nick Aswells, I really am Nick Aswells. Um, you know, you have to assume that you've been breached, right? So somebody's in your environment trying to get to your data and you want to protect it. So all these actions need to be scrutinized and decisions need to be based, based, based on that, right? You need improved outcomes in your security. Typically, right, like I mentioned earlier, you know, somebody who was inside an environment before, you know, had an assumed level of trust, right? They're a user with credentials in your network so they can access certain things. And this is really turning that on its head, right? You know, everything should be authenticated. You shouldn't trust your devices. You shouldn't trust your workloads. You shouldn't trust your users. You should make them tell you who they are and do this multiple times. Excuse me. And then you have to verify this, you know, frequently and continuously because security posture changes over time. And just because when I walked in the door, you know, I should have been there, it doesn't mean I should be there later, right? I might have walked into a movie, then left that theater when the movie was over, walked into another theater, right? It, it's that type of context that needs to be applied. And then the big thing here in forming all your decisions is unified analytics, right? Everything happening in your environment needs to be logged. It needs to be analyzed. And then that analysis is gonna really base, you know, one, how you approach zero trust initially, you know, who's accessing what applications, should they be accessing it, building policy against that. And then once you move on, that data is gonna inform the continued access. So, you know, today there are, you know, assets sit in a lot of different places, right? You have things in public and private clouds, you have internet facing assets, you've got unsanctioned cloud assets which for a lot of organizations is a huge problem. Um, you know, typically it's developers putting things out in the cloud, outside of cloud accounts that are run by your organization. And you know, that creates a huge security risk. Um, you know, on-premises access that at assets that are externally facing, you know, IoT, uh, BYOD devices, and probably, you know, the, the two biggest things are supply chain assets where we've seen a lot of recent attacks, you know, solar winds. Uh, comes to mind, and then M and A, right? You know, how do you know when you're acquiring a company, you're that their postures are secure, and how do you incorporate them into your environment? I didn't realize I had this made as a build-out slide, but you know, this is a bit of an eye chart. But as you look at where we've been in the past when it comes to our networks, our security, our assets. And where we've gone today, you know, the perimeter is no longer physical, it's logical because assets exist in so many different places. So, you know, you, you have to rationalize how, how you secure things that, that are sitting in disparate places in the world. You know, networks aren't flat anymore. You know, micro segmentation is key to controlling access between applications. You know, policy is no longer static, it's dynamic. You know, you, you need to be able to make decisions not only on a user's persona, 
but on an asset's behavior, right? If, you know, and, and I'll talk about this in more detail on some later slides, but, you know, if something's been compromised and it's not behaving in the way you expect, you need to be able to isolate it quickly and not have to kick off a lengthy investigation process before you're able to actually look at what's happening because, you know, attackers these days can move laterally inside of a network extremely quickly. And if you're not reacting at the same speed they are, you're already at a disadvantage. Um, you know, policies should be context-based today versus network-based. You know, previous slide, you know, the attack surface is very broad and analytics are needed to, to really wrap your heads around what's going on in your environments. Um, encryption is key, right? You know, if, if you're not encrypting your data, somebody can steal it far more easily. You know, and again, right, classifying your data. What's important? What isn't important? You know, how do you tag your data so that if people are moving it around inside your network, you can track that and make sure it's not being taken outside of your network. And then, you know, back in the day, you know, hackers were script kiddies, right? You know, that they were doing things for, you know, really for fun, right? And now we're facing nation state adversaries and we're also face, facing commoditized attacks, right? So, you know, even the people that are out there buying um, attacks on forums on the internet, you know, are, are getting very advanced tools that have lots of automation built into it. They come with instructions, you know, and, and they're paying not a lot of money for this, you know, and the tools are pretty good. So, you know, I talked about this sort of constant reevaluation of what's happening inside of your network. And, and this is from a user perspective, but this also applies to, you know, servers and applications running inside of the network. And the, the analogy I like to use here is that of an airport. <clears throat> you know, you're, you're going somewhere and you're getting on an international flight and you get to the airport, you go to the check-in desk, you give them your passport. They verify that, hey, this is really Nick Aswell's checking in. They put my passport information into the system, hand me my ticket. Then I walk over to a security checkpoint, right? And that guy looks at my passport again, he looks at my ticket and he's like, okay, <clears throat> you know, we, we believe you're Nick and, you, and that you're flying to Ireland. Now I've got to go through security. I've got to put my bags on the conveyor belt. I've got to take my laptop out. They're going to look at that. You know, maybe they pull my laptop off and they swab it for bomb residue, <clears throat> right? There, there's all these inherent security checks. And even after I've gone through security, yeah, I'm being watched. Right, there's cameras, there are security guards, they're saying, is this guy doing something suspicious? If he is, hey, you know, we, we want to pull him out, we want to question him, you know. And then finally, once I get to the gate, I've got to present my ticket or my passport again, right? They want to make sure the guy getting on the plane is the same guy who went through security. And when I get to Ireland, same thing. I'm, I'm going to go through customs, they're going to look at me, they're going to evaluate me, and then decide, yeah, should I be let into the country? If they let me in, they probably made a mistake. But, you know, there, there you have it. I've been checked. And that, that's really what's happening here, right? Your users are accessing a resource and, and you're doing an initial evaluation, right? It, is their device compliant? Um, are they who they say they are? You know, what have their behaviors been, right? So based on those things, you're going to say, okay, hey, we're, we're going to give you access to this critical resource. And this needs to be constantly reevaluated because once somebody's accessing a resource, their posture can change, right? They might turn off their antivirus, um, checking other endpoint, so, you know, security on their box, or maybe while they're accessing that data, you, you know, your security infrastructure and your logs have seen that they're reaching out to a command control server. You know, or something like that. So it's that constant reevaluation that looks at what the user is doing and then can reinform policy. And you know, I have user on the left, but really this access is based on persona, right? You don't want to manage individual user access. You want to say that, hey, Nick is somebody who works in accounting, so we're going to give him access to accounting systems, but he's not going to get access to source code or HR systems. And you know, even looking at that, right? If I'm trying to access things outside of my area, there, there should be analytics that are looking at that saying, hey, you know, what is Nick doing? Does this deviate from his normal behavior? And then if it does, you know, we're, we're gonna update it. We're gonna put Nick into a group that says, you know what, he might be a compromised user that we wanna apply more scrutiny to, right? And that scrutiny might involve, you know, DLP, it might involve locking down my access to critical resources until somebody in your SOC can, 
evaluate, hey, are the things that I'm doing things I'm supposed to be doing? You know, am I trying to exfiltrate data? Things like that. So th this is really where zero trust becomes very important because if you're not able to reevaluate your posture in real time, your data is at a lot more risk. So, you know, how, how do we achieve this? Um, the DAS acronym on the left here, you know, stands for Data Applications, Assets, and Services. And this came out of NIST um, a handful of years ago. And you, you have to identify all these things, right? You know, wh what are the crown jewels? What do you have to protect? What are your applications? What do users access? How do they access it? And, you know, from when and where, right? You know, wh what are the assets in my environment? And then what are the services that are available? You know, based on these things, the first step is to understand how my applications work. And it's not an easy task. Um, this is probably where most of the struggles come in because if you're, if you're an enterprise that's been around for a number of years, you have a lot of legacy, you have a lot of applications that people probably don't understand anymore. So you really need to put in place you know, policies and procedures that allow you to understand how these communications happen. So you can begin you know, building a framework around how do you secure them. And you know, as part of this, everybody wants to protect the crown jewels first. If you do that, you're gonna break things in a very bad way. You need to pick something simple, you know, something that is accessed you know, relatively frequent, frequently, but if it breaks, nobody's gonna get very upset about and learn there. And then apply the lessons learned as you move into your more important assets. You know, when, once you understand what you have to protect, you can start defining architectures against it. And you know, there's no silver bullet here. You know, these, these architectures are customized on a per environment basis because no two environments look the same. They don't have the same applications configured in the same ways that are accessed in the same ways. And these architectures need to protect at layer seven. You know, do, doing things at layer two and three these days um, isn't enough because I might say that, hey, you know, th this flow that I'm looking at, you know, I think is web traffic. But if I'm not sure, it could be something else entirely, and it could be a command control channel, it could be a data exfiltration channel, and I, I need to know what's happening in my network is what's really happening, not just what I think is happening. You know, once you have this architecture, you can start to build your policies, and we typically talk about using the Kipling method to do this, and I'll, I'll talk about what it is in, in more depth, but, you know, you know, who's accessing the resource, right? You know, this would, you know, you would look at this as an employee on a corporate provi provided device or a managed device. You know, what's the resource they're accessing? Well, they're accessing source code, right? Maybe they're going to GitHub. Um, you know, what are they accessing this resource? Well, you know, during business hours, right? You know, may maybe your developers aren't ever accessing things at night. So you can start locking down policy based on when they do it, you know, and you know where, where is this data stored, right? It might be in GitHub, it might be in an on-prem GitLab, it might be some other source control system. You know, why are they accessing it? Well, they're accessing it because they're a developer and that's part of their job function, right? And there's a business justification behind that level of access for them. You know, and then how is this accessed? So, well, they're accessing it via the web, right? We wanna do full, full inspection on this traffic because it's a critical resource. We wanna fully decrypt everything that's going on you know, with the access of that resource. And then, you know, maybe based on all the previous items, you know, we might just grant them read access versus read write access because they're accessing it from an unmanaged device, you know, or they're accessing it out of business hours or, you know, Nick usually logs in and looks at source code from his home in Chicago, but now he's logging in from South Korea. So we want to put a little more scrutiny there. You know, so, you know, finally, you know, wh where do we start? Um, you know, I, I think one of the takeaways here is that, you know, this shouldn't be hard, but it's going to be hard work. And the, the approach here is that you, you need to have different people in your organization involved. You know, it's, it's not just gonna be the network security teams that are looking at this. 
you know, even within security, it involves network, endpoint, uh, the SOC, analytics, all that stuff. It, it involves different groups that own these applications. It involves different, different executives and different organizations inside of your organization, right? It's not one product. You can't just put in the firewall or sassy and say, hey, I have zero trust, right? Identity is probably one of the biggest pieces of this. You know, if you don't have IAM, you're gonna fail because you don't know who's accessing your resources and you can't control it. Um, and then once you can figure out who these people are and what they're doing, you can then start applying that to policy and your architectures. But without that, you know, you're, you're, you're gonna fail. Um, and again, you know, no single technology can solve this. There's multiple pieces of technology that need to get integrated. And if you can find a platform that solves a lot of these problems for you, you're gonna be a lot better off than doing the integration yourself because that's a lot more manual process. And anytime you have manual process in, in these workflows, you know, you're always running the risk of things are gonna break. Um, you know, don't think that you have to apply all these policies in a single place. You don't. There's various tools, you know, I sell firewalls. Firewalls are, are one of the places you can do this and one of the places you should do this. But, you know, there's endpoint security products. There's endpoint identity products that allow you to identify your applications and lock down how they communicate and who they communicate with. <clears throat> um, there's API gateways that you can use to secure your APIs, you know, cloud platforms, you know, whether it's Amazon or Google or Microsoft or Oracle, <clears throat> have a lot of intrinsic features where you that you can use to lock down uh, your communications inside of those environments. So it's identifying that, you know, where can you enforce this policy? And then how are these exit decisions made? Um, you know, what information do you have today to inform your policy? That's gonna be key because it needs to be accurate and it needs to be real time. You know, if it's not real time, then you're gonna be behind the eight ball because you, you can't react to a changing landscape quickly. Um, and with that real time policy, you need to automate against it. If you're not automating against it, again, you're already behind the eight ball because adversaries can move faster than you can react. You know, and, and short of unplugging your internet connection, you know, you, you don't really have a way to start remediating a major breach. Um, there's gonna be resources that are gonna be very difficult to secure, right? And, you know, I don't know if, you, if you're all familiar with the whole pets versus cattle conversation, but, you know, in the IT world, pets are, you know, assets that have names, right? They're things that if they go away, your infrastructure, your, your services are gonna be impacted tremendously, right? You know, mainframes, um, you know, legacy databases, things like that fall into that pets category, you know, and cattle are things that when they get sick, well, you can kill them and get a new cow, right? You know, if, if you have a resource that's behaving strangely, you can get rid of it, spin up a new one in this place, you know, very quickly and everybody's happy. Um, you know, th those pets need to be protected. And I'm guessing everybody here has pets. Um, you know, where is business critical data located, right? You know, what, once you've got your feet under you, you understand how you want to start protecting these things and, and you've got a good architecture in place and a policy to implement security around, around stuff. You need to know where this data is located. You need to put walls around it and you need to protect that first. Um, you know, and what level of trust needed to access it? You know, who, who should be accessing the crown jewels versus at, you know, directly versus accessing it in an abstracted way. Um, you know, what's your roadmap for adoption? And that roadmap, you know, should, you know, re really be built against your risk profiles. And, you know, it, it should start out with low risk assets, you know, ramp up to high risk assets and then ramp back down to everything else once you've, you know, gotten a good running start. You know, and, and then finally, you know, you have to use appropriate friction for authentication. If somebody is logging in, you know, they're on a corporate network and they're accessing your know, common resource like Workday, you know, or 
you know, the, your ticketing system, right, to open an IT ticket, they probably don't need a high level of scrutiny, you know, but when they're accessing things like your accounting systems, your source code and stuff, you, you need to really make sure that user is who they say they are, right? Are, are, are they coming from a trusted resource? Are they coming from a known location? You know, are they on a low risk resource? You know, and even if all those things are true, you're gonna say, hey, you're accessing the crown jewels. You know, we're gonna prompt you for additional authentication. You, know, you go to GitHub, you get a pop-up that says, okay, you know, authenticate through Okta or, or whatever your multi-factor authentication is. You know, if, if you look back, you know, I mentioned SolarWinds earlier, if you look back to that, that's really where um, the SolarWinds attackers got caught inside of FireEye. You know, there was somebody inside of FireEye whose credentials had been compromised uh, by those attackers, and his phone popped up an Okta message that said, "Hey, you're trying to access this thing." And he's like, "I'm not trying to access it." He hit no. He opened up an IT ticket saying. I got this alert. That's how Fire I figured out they had been breached, you know, almost a month later. So it's controls like that that are really key to, you know, once everything else has failed, figuring out where, you know, what's going on inside of your environment. So I want to be cognizant of time here. I've got a couple of minutes left. <clears throat> you know, a couple of high level architectural examples. You know, how do you look at adaptive access, right? You know, you, you've got a lot of data inside of your environment that you need to consider when you're saying, hey, do I give somebody access here? Um, you know, th that should all go into, you know, ideally some type of central repository. You know, it can be an analytics data lake. It can be a SIM, you know, it can be whatever it is. And then on top of that, you're going to run your analytics, right? You're going to take those analytics, you're going to put them into different tools inside of your environment that are going to then make access decisions for you, right? And probably the big thing is going to be your SIM is going to be pulling information out of those logs and sending it into a SOAR tool, you know, which stands for Security Operations Automation and Response Tool, that can then say, hey, you know, so something is happening here. I have to make an automated response here, right? I'm going to toss Nick into an untrusted users group because he's doing something strange. And then you know, we're going to do, we're going to run some playbooks against that to see what he's doing, maybe kick it over to an analyst, maybe determine that, hey, this is normal and take him out of that group, but we need to be able to react quickly, right? And from that, you need high fidelity alerts to act on. So, you know, high level, this is a very basic workflow for incident response for somebody doing something strange inside of your environment. And, you know, user access example, right? No matter where the user is coming from, no matter where they're sitting, they need to have the same level of enforcement and, and you have to control that. Um, you know, security has to be ubiquitous and it's gotta be everywhere. And, you know, common policy is gonna reduce the chance for mistakes. Um, you know, you've got to inspect all your traffic, right? You have to decrypt, you have to know what your users are doing at all time. It can't just be web traffic. <clears throat> It has to be everything. <clears throat> and, how, and how you achieve that is going to be based on the tools you have available, right? It might still be backhauling data, which a lot of companies don't want to do today. But if you need that level of inspection and that's the only place you can do it, you're, you're still going to have to bring that data back in-house. And then, you know, finally, we talked a lot about users, but securing applications is also key because attackers aren't just going to go after your users and their credentials. They're going to attack your apps. And you know, th this is a very basic three-tier web, web service example, but you know, when you're designing these things, you, you've, had a you've had a bunch of front-end web servers and they should never talk to each other. They should talk to your application tier, they should talk to your users, and that's pretty much it, right? Your application tier might have some communications between it inside of that environment. You know, it might not, depending on how you've designed it. You know, but they should talk to your databases and your web servers. Again, nothing else, right? And then your databases are gonna have some requirements around them because they are they fall more into that pets category that I mentioned. You know, they're gonna synchronize with, with each other. They're very important assets. So if, if you can rationalize your applications in this way and understand how they should be talking, the second something deviates from it, you know, it, one of two things has probably happened here. Um, either, there's been a change to the application that you weren't aware of and you need to figure that out 
and update your policies and then talk to whoever changed it and say, hey, you know, there's a process you have to follow for updating these things, you know, or you've been breached and you need to react very quickly. So I think with that, we're out of time. Um, you know, th thank you all for listening to me for the past half hour. I hope this was um, informational and helpful to you. That's great, Nick. Thank you very much. That was um, very informative, very interesting. I think you, I've just sat through one of the first presentations ever where somebody like you never mentioned your company name. I tell you, if I was given a presentation years ago on Netfort, I would have mentioned our company name about 10 times. So well done. <laughs> <laughs> um, but going back to the start where you mentioned, I think you mentioned Google, which is interesting. And you mentioned proxies and um, VPNs, firewalls, I assume. And, you know, thinking about Google, like in the resources that, that they have. <clears throat> so I guess kind of two questions around that. One would, you know, I'm kind of thinking in terms of like, are they like, I'm not picking on Google, but like, how, how hard is it to get to become really full 100% zero trust? Like it's, it sounds like, it sounds uh, expensive even for large companies who have the resources. And I guess the kind of second question is how realistic is it for smaller companies? I don't know if those two questions make sense. Yeah, I, I think it's, you know, it's always a moving target for a lot of companies um, because things are changing overall you know, in their environments, if you can get to a point where you understand the applications in your environment and you can have a fairly sane way of providing access to them, um, you know, I think you can get very close. There's gonna be stuff that falls by the wayside, but if you have the visibility in your environment and the analytics on top of your access control, I think you can get pretty close, um, you know, but it, it's a multi-year journey. Right, you know, no, nobody approaches this and says, "Hey, I've 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 achieved zero trust in a year." Um, you know, mo most of the companies that are really going after this, you know, it probably takes them three, four, five years um, to to get there. And I don't know that anybody ever achieves it 100. percent Right, I don't know if that's even possible. But you know, it it, it is a long time to get there, and, and it has to be a journey. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. I guess so. So just on that, a small bit more, just. Could you take a recent example, for example, of a company you, or a customer you worked with and say, in terms of the technology and maybe the culture, what were the major things that stood out for you that they had to, they had to do? You know, the, the, the big things were, you know, I would say it's two things. Um, you know, providing secure access for users can, can be an easier task. Um, securing your applications inside of a data center especially when it's inside of a legacy data center where, where your control surfaces tend to be at the edge, um, becomes very difficult, right? And a lot of organizations, you know, while, while they think they know how their applications communicate and where their critical data lives, they tend to spend a lot of time once they start digging into it, figuring out what that really looks like because, you know, these applications have been developed over time, data has been put in different places over time, and the people that did it, you know, oftentimes aren't with the company anymore. So it's that whole rediscovery process on where do my assets sit and how, how should I really be protecting them? I mean, I guess, and as you mentioned, like Palo Alto Networks will be very well known and a market leader in the firewall market for years. And, you know, especially over the last few years with remote working and all the way things have changed in most organizations and with zero trust thrown on top of it. And, you know, I guess it was, it could make a major impact on your, on the whole next generation firewall kind of market and space. Like, how do you see that turning out in the next few years? You know, I, 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 don't, I don't think firewalls are going to go away anytime soon, but I think over the next three to five years, you're going to see a lot more of that, of those features being delivered as a service. You know, we, we've got something called Prisma Access, which is a SASE product, right? Which is moving all that functionality for user access or remote site access into the cloud, right? And, and reducing the need to have the firewalls on-prem. Um, you know, what, one of my largest customers, you know, they are about 600,000 employees today, I think a little over that. Um, they, they have a vision, you know, in, in the next five years or so to get to the point where they've moved security enforcement as close to the edge as possible. 
you know, their, their offices are, are really offering, you know, minimal wireless and printing services. Um, but, you know, everything else inside of them is outsourced from door security to the wireless security and, and really the enforcement's happening on that laptop and on the service they're connecting to. So, you know, from that perspective, I, I think you're still going to see firewalls deployed in virtual form factors and cloud services. I think as long as you, as, you have on-prem data centers, you're still going to be deploying firewalls there. But, but I think, you know, when it comes to an, especially an office perspective, that's going to start falling off probably, you know, in the next few years. Yeah, like you were, you, you were, like you were talking about, like looking at where your data is, like and especially over the last few years, the data has moved to the cloud. The Crown Jewels has moved to the cloud. A lot of people, that's their data. Like people don't really have much data on their desktops or laptops anymore, even like it's all in the cloud. So, you know, that makes perfect sense. Um, I guess last question, and you mentioned it as well, as the US government uh, executive order. Um, came out from earlier this year, I think it was, from Biden, our own zero trust. And, you know, you think of like the colonial, uh, the colonial pipe breach, for example, mm -hmm. and which is not a government organization, right? Uh, it's a private company based in Atlanta, I think. Uh, at that order, does, not, does it cover uh, organizations like colonial pipe? You know, I, I think it, I think there are more recommendations these days, um, but I think that as time goes on, you know, and the U.S. government, you know, at least today looks like they're on the forefront of this, um, at least with the announcements they've made. But I don't think they fully have their arms wrapped around, you know, how, how to um, how to make this a compliance thing. I, I think that's going to come, you know, over the next few years. But, you know, if you look at the NIST architecture that came out last year, that applies to DOD and other secure organizations in the US. But you know, e even with DISA, right, there's no centralized organization mandating these things even for the US government. So I, I think it's gonna take a while for the government to wrap their heads around it and, and really start making mandates against what you have to do. Um, you know, some states in the US at least have different requirements around reporting and compliance for, for certain security things, you know, and, so, and some of those can have monetary or, or jail um, recourse for executives yeah. that are report, reporting properly and things like that. But I mean, I, I think a lot of this stuff is in infancy, unfortunately. Which makes, it, which makes it more than a recommendation, which is good, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if, you, if your butt's on the line, you're, you're yeah, gonna, yeah, absolutely. You're yeah, yeah. Especially for a director or something. Anyway, um, so, just somebody asked here as well. Could you can you share out the, the can you send out the presentation there on material? Can you send out those slides for, so people can have them after? Be great. Yeah, we can share that as a PDF. Great, thank you. And another question: Is there an example of machine learning tracking the interprocess traffic? Yeah, I don't know on that side of things. Um, right now. You know, probably in the cloud security side of things, and really, you know, this is micro segmentation at a VM and container level. You know, there, there are some products out there. We bought a company um, whose name escapes me right now, but essentially, you know, we're applying identity to containers so that we can control how the containers communicate within an environment, and we're actually putting shims inside of those headers. You know, that, that's a cryptographic value so that the receiving application can verify, hey, should I actually be receiving this traffic or not? You know, be, beyond that, I'm, I'm not aware of like any inter-process stuff that, that's going on. You know, containers solve some of those problems, but not all of them. Mm -hmm. Makes sense, yeah. Um, one last question. Hey, Nick, super presentation. Must be one of your relations from Westport, by the way. Um, <laughs> how important do you see the elements of road-based access control and segregation of duties when assigning access to systems when implementing the zero trust model approach? I mean, I, I think those are crucial, right? You know, if somebody's in a system and, you know, they, they have a certain role, you know, you, you want to restrict access to anything beyond that role. Um, you know, it, on, on the one hand, right, it can lead to mistakes being made by that user. On, on the other hand, it, it's something that can be exploited by an attacker potentially. So, you know, if, if they don't need it, don't give it to them. I, I think that's, you know, very, very important. Excellent. All right, Nick, that was 
Fantastic. Listen, on behalf of ITAG and everybody in the presentation, thank you again very much for your time. Thanks to everybody for joining in on behalf of ITAG and joining the conversation and all the questions. Uh, really appreciate it, guys. Hope that was okay. Thanks, Ben. Thank you all. Take yeah, care. Thanks, everybody. Right. Well done. Thank you. That's great, Nick. Well done. Thank you. No, thanks, John. Appreciate it. Talk to you again sometime. Take care. For sure. Take care.